entitled From New Light to Baptist, Harris Harding and the Second Great Awakening in Nova Scotia. Contemporaries call the unprecedented outburst of religious enthusiasm which engulfed much of Nova Scotia in 1806, 1807, 1808, the Great Reformation. It was not referred to as a mere revival of religion, but rather in terms which William G. McLaughlin has used to describe profound revitalization movements. It was regarded as being more than a revival, and it was. It was perhaps the most spectacular outward manifestation of one of the most important social movements in Nova Scotia history, the so-called Second Great Awakening. The principal actor in the unfolding drama of the Second Great Awakening, as well as a crucial human link connecting Henry Allen's New Light movement with the evolving Baptist church, was the controversial Nova Scotia preacher, Harris Harding. To some interest, that so much has been written about, no about Nova Scotia's First Great Awakening and relatively little about the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening, it may be argued, stretched from 1790 to 1810. There were a number of local revivals in the early period and a more general revival at the turn of the century. Then came the Great Reformation, the remarkable culmination of the earlier revivals the spiritual and emotional peak, if you wish, of the revitalization movement. The First Great Awakening has received a great deal of scholarly attention for three major reasons, I think. First, it occurred at the time of the American Revolution. And since so many historians are and have been very interested in the Revolution, some have focused their attention on the relationship of the awakening to Nova Scotia's enigmatic response to the Revolution. Second, the First Great Awakening owed a great deal to a single charismatic leader, Henry Allen, who left to posterity a journal, over 500 hymns, a number of sermons, and two major treatises. Allen, like a giant magnet, has attracted scholars. Third, some attention has been drawn to Nova Scotia's First Great Awakening because of what to many is the continuing scholarly preoccupation with New England's First Great Awakening and the relative paucity until recently of serious studies dealing with New England's Second Great Awakening. Nova Scotia's First Great Awakening has been perceived in a variety of ways by different historians and scholars. For Morris Armstrong, the religious revival was simply a retreat from the grim realities of the world to the safety and pleasantly exciting warmth of the revival meeting and to profits and rewards of another character. According to S.D. Clark, it was basically a reflection of the collapse of the traditional leadership of the Nova Scotia village communities and the development of a great mass movement of social protest against the colony's capital, Halifax. The Great Awakening, in other words, was an outsettlement democratic protest against traditionalism, against authority. For J.M. Bumstead, the Great Awakening of Nova Scotia was principally a movement of spiritual reform, much like those which had over the centuries convulsed Christendom. And as far as Gordon Stewart is concerned, Allen's awakening was the means whereby many confused and disoriented Nova Scotians resolved their collective identity crisis during the American Revolutionary War. But Allen, according to some of my most recent work, also operated at another level of understanding. Allen preached the simple, emotional evangelical gospel of the new birth, and thus provided a powerful new personal and spiritual relationship between Christ and the redeemed believer in a world where all traditional relationships were falling apart. It's a combination of them could also be applied to the Second Great Awakening. Yet, there are certain dangers in looking for sophisticated explanations of a complex event before that event is understood, even at a most elementary or rudimentary level. What is necessary first is to discern in as sensitive and sophisticated a manner as possible the essential anatomy of the awakening. It is essential first to come to grips with the chronology of events 
and the personalities and issues involved. Once this is done, then a few possible explanations may be put forward. But still, these must be put forward in a hesitant and almost reluctant manner. On December the 5th, 1806, the Reverend T.H. Chipman, the influential Baptist minister from Annapolis, reported to the readers of the Massachusetts Baptist Missionary Magazine that he had been in the Yarmouth Argyle area for five weeks, and that such glorious times I never saw before. Multitudes are turned to God, he observed. I cannot with ink and pen describe the one half what God has done. He went on, since the work began three months ago, there have been about 150 souls brought to own Jesus as their rightful Lord and sovereign King. We've had two church meetings, and surely I never saw such meetings before. It was indeed the house of God and the very gate of heaven. The last Saturday we began at 10 in the morning and continued until 8 in the evening to hear persons relate the dealings of God with their souls and then a great number were prevented for want of time. A great many of the subjects of this work have been young people and children, seldom a meeting, but some are brought to embrace the offers of life, sometimes five, six, and seven at a meeting. There are meetings in some parts of the town almost every day. Late in January 1808, the Reverend Harris Harding, who played a key role in triggering the Great Reformation, also wrote to the Massachusetts Baptist Missionary Magazine. For Harding, previous to the Lord's pouring upon us the gracious effusions of his Holy Spirit, there had been a great declension in religion, attended with great discouragement of souls in believers, in coldness, backwardness, and neglect of religious duties. Since the 5th of October last, he went on, 140 persons had been baptized and upwards of 200 persons have been savingly united in Christ. What is remarkable is that the estimated total population of the immediate Yarmouth area was only approximately 1,000. And of this number, some, of course, were Acadian Roman Catholics and other staunch Anglicans. To the east of Yarmouth, in the townships of Argyll and Barrington, Harding pointed out that God has also been ple pleased to revive his gracious work. It was a region which Harding had frequently visited, and he was understandably delighted when his close friend, the Reverend Enoch Towner, could report on April the 13th, 1807, that in the autumn of the previous year, the Lord had begun his work in Argyle. As had been the case in Yarmouth, it would also be the case in other areas of Nova Scotia. The early momentum in the awakening was provided by teenagers, and some were even younger. According to Towner, the young professors manifested a desire to follow their Lord's commands, to be buried with him in baptism. I was at a loss how to proceed, but resolved to hear their experiences. Nine, including seven young converts, were baptized. After this, the work spread with great power, and people assembled from all parts of the town. I thought it proper to send for Brother Harris Harding, as he had formerly labored among them. Ten came forward and were baptized. We both went in the water together to show that we agreed in heart and practice. The glory of the Lord seemed to overshadow the place and move on the baptismal waters. From July 1806 to late October, Towner baptized over 100 people. Then in the early months of 1807, he noticed that the divine presence had once again filled the place, many giving glory to their Redeemer and many deeply wounded with a sense of their sins. He concluded his report by stressing that the last Sabbath in March, 20 came forward and were baptized. There were five baptisms in the winter season. 24 have told their experiences who are not yet baptized, and a number of others are under hopeful impressions. The work is still going on in this place and spreading rapidly in different parts of this province. One of these different parts was Liverpool a settlement where the Baptists were relatively weak, but the, where the New Lights, Henry Allen's followers, had always been strong, and where, moreover, Harding had spent many months over the years preaching his special brand of Christianity. In March 1807, the Reverend John Paysant, the one ordained New Light minister in Nova Scotia, who had stubbornly refused to become a Baptist, noted the number of women and young people 
on the geographical periphery of Liverpool experienced conversion and were moving from house to house and telling what great things the Lord had done for them. There were nightly meetings and the young people were especially active. The Reverend Paysant was not at all involved at this early stage in what he described as a wonderful moving among the people of the power of God. Finally, on March the 3rd, what Paysant referred to as the fire began to kindle and the flame engulf his meeting house. At night meeting, as soon as the sermon was ended, the people began to shout from all sides of the house, either crying for mercy under a sense of their perishing condition or rejoicing and blessing God for his goodness to them. The sinners were cut down by the almighty power of God under a sense that they were in a ruined condition and the Lord had appeared for a number of them. Their language was the Lord has appeared and delivered my soul. He has made an everlasting covenant with my soul. I shall reign with him to all eternity. And as soon as anyone came out, they would call to others to come and partake with them, telling them that there was mercy for them, for they had been the worst of sinners, and acknowledging all their bad deeds. If there were any person that they had anything against, they were the first that they went to and asked their pardon. All offenses were made up and the meeting continued till day. The number that experienced the love of God on their hearts are not yet ascertained. There were more than 20 that came out clear, but it's thought by some that stayed all night that there were more than 50 who experienced the love of God. The next day, by the break of day, the streets were full of people of all descriptions and it appeared that there were 10 times as many people in the place as before. So it continued all day, they going about from house to house. There was no business on that week, but little victuals dressed. The people were so many, for there were old and young, rich and poor, male and female, black and white, all met together and appeared to be as one. At night they came into the meeting house in their manner. The meeting house echoed with their praises and rejoicing, so that there was no public singing or prayers, but the whole night was spent in that manner. It was judged that there were above a thousand people. After the meeting, the assembled throng went from house to house. They were led in quotes again from the Paysant description, many small boys and girls, some of them telling the goodness of God, others in distress, exhausted, conscious, strict, and introspective, yet enjoying their unexpected influence and power. The young inhabitants of Liverpool continued to witness during the day and to meet together at night. The adults of the evening meetings complained of the constant noise and the yelling. They wanted to hear sermons, and moreover, they demanded order. The young refused to abandon what they considered to be practices sanctioned by the Holy Spirit. At the end of March, 24 joined the church. At that special service, more than a thousand people attended. The entire next week was spent in having meetings. Every night, the young people meeting in various places, for they were too numerous to meet in one place. Whenever a number of them met together, it was noted the time was spent singing hymns and in praying. The meetings continued until August when Harris Harding arrived. Harding obviously wanted to make Baptists of all the new converts. Paysant vociferously opposed the move and the Reformation was replaced by bitter sectarian strife. Some were, according to Paysant, dipped in bitter water of baptism. It, it appeared, he spitefully maintained, that they thought to dip people in water with all that religion was needful. At Chester, the Reverend Joseph Dimmock noted in his journal that in August of 1807, the Lord made a glorious descent upon the earth against the strongholds of sin and of Satan and caused a great shaking among the dry bones. And bone came to his bone, so the Sabbath on which the work broke out was concluded with a great shout among the saints and a great outcry among sinners for mercy. Our meetings are large for people throng in great abundance from er every quarter to hear. On the first Sunday in October, 20 people were baptized, including Dimmock's wife. 14 were baptized on the next two Sundays, and by late November, more than 40 had been baptized, both young and old, as he put it, male and female. It is noteworthy that the revitalization movements in Yarmouth, Argyle, Liverpool, and Chester owed so much to Harris Harding. Over the years, he had carefully cultivated this area. In 1806 and 1807, what was commonly referred to 
as the rich harvest of souls was finally reaped. But in other regions of Nova Scotia, considerable life was breathed into the movement by, vis by visiting Massachusetts Baptist preachers like Isaac Case, Daniel Merrill, Henry Hale, and Amos Allen. Spurred by the events of the Second Great Awakening in New England, and inspired by what they knew was occurring in Yarmouth and Argyle, these Yankee Baptists brought in late 1807 what they called a Reformation to the Baptist heartland located at Horton and Cornwallis, and also to the Onslow and Cumberland regions of Nova Scotia. It seems clear that the Great Reformation was of considerable importance in consolidating the position of the Baptist Church in Nova Scotia in particular and in the maritime region in general. The revitalization movement provided a means whereby the revivalistic paradigm first articulated and applied by Henry Allen was appropriated by the Nova Scotia Baptists. The new life tradition significantly shaped by new events and personalities, in other words, became the Baptist heritage. And considerable light is shed on this often complex process of transformation by an examination of the fascinating early life and career of Harris Harding. According to one who knew him, the Reverend I.E. Bill, writing in 1880, Harding's pulpit talents, intellectually considered, were never brilliant, but they were generally effective and useful. Bill went on to describe perceptively what he considered to be the strengths and weaknesses of one of the Baptist fathers. In strictest sense, he was an extemporaneous preacher. He deemed it of far more importance that the heart should be burning with love than the head should be stored with matter. Talking about university life. If in addressing a congregation, he never dazzled with the splendor of his eloquence, he often touched their sympathies and moved their hearts as he descanted upon the Savior's love. At times, there was a melting pathos in his utterances, which was overpowering. While there was a little method in his discourses, they were generally delivered with fervor and interspersed with anecdotes illustrative of the topics he was discussing. As regards religious zeal and activity, every day was devoted to God, and in this respect, his long life was one continuing Sabbath. For the Reverend E.M. Saunders in 1902, the dramatic power and eloquence of personal magnetism were effective forces in the personality of Harding. He skillfully spiced his anecdotes and conversation with a touch of comedy, as natural to him as his breath. His imitations of people of peculiar speech were the delight especially of children. For the one who knew Harding at the beginning of his preaching career, there was little of redeeming value either in his character or in his preaching style. It was Simeon Perkins' contention in 1792 that Harding's, in quote, extravagant gestures and wild motions of his body and his hands, etc., is to me very disgusting, and the pain he seems to be in breath is distressing. The Liverpool merchant and general factotum later maintained that a man of his character and principle should never be permitted to preach the Christian gospel. Harding was, in, Perkin, in Perkins' eyes, a dangerous antinomian who practiced what he preached. For example, on September the 28th, 1796, Harding had been forced to marry, in Perkins' words, a young woman, Hetty Huntington, said to be pregnant by him. For his biographer and co-minister at Yarmouth, the Reverend J. Davis, Harding was an erratic genius. He was not as Davis puts it, not in every sense a great man, and the loftier reaches of argument and eloquence were beyond him. His utterance was ready, quick, overflowing, apt to be loud and vociferous, in his early days accompanied with much gesticulation and movement to and fro. Deep also was his pathos, abundant with unction, while his tears were frequent. Out of the pulpit, he seemed to live by local motion. Until arrested by his last sickness, he was almost always on the road, alike on the move in winter as in summer. His capital was not so large as that of some other men, 
but he kept turning it over and over perpetually until it had yielded an ample increase and made its possessor rich in good works, superintendent in the fruits of his godly diligence. And as far as his close associate, the Reverend Theodore S. Harding, was concerned, Harris Harding, as a preacher, was not a man with any kind of method. He dwelt most on the experimental part of religion and greatly excelled in it. His great forte was telling stories. He was full of anecdotes. He was, one would say this is a Nova Scotia tradition. He was eminently useful in the conversation, in the conversion of sinners, perhaps more so than any man in this country. He would sometimes seem to prophesy and mark out people that he thought should be converted. He seemed to have an uncommon spirit of discernment that way. Perhaps those who knew him best, the members of his Yarmouth congregation, described in 1854 his long ministry in the community in this way. For nearly 70 years, 60 of which were spent in this neighborhood, he proclaimed the gospel which he loved with unweary diligence and extraordinary success. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Harding was born in Horton on October the 10th, 1761, of Yankee pre-loyalist stock. Soon after his birth, his parents returned to Connecticut. During the early part of the Revolutionary War, though only a teenager, Harding apparently supported the Patriot side. He was arrested by the British and imprisoned on a man of war. In 1783, at the age of 22, and despite his wartime activities, Harding returned to the Horton area with his father. Harding became a school teacher. He also attended local New Light services conducted by the Reverend John Paysant, Henry Allen's brother-in-law. In 1783, Paysant and Thomas Hanley Chipman were the only ordained New Light preachers in Nova Scotia. And on Allen's death in 1784, each regarded himself as Allen's logical successor. Paysant would always be opposed to the Baptists, regarding adult baptism, as had Allen, as a non-essential. Chipman, on the other hand, had been baptized in 1779, soon after he'd been converted by Allen. If any one man pushed the New Light movement in the direction of the Baptist Church, it was Chipman. He could do it because Nova Scotians knew that he was one of Allen's closest associates. He had crisscrossed the colony with the Falmouth evangelist. Chipman had, in a sense, been legitimized by Allen's success and friendship. He struggled long and hard with Paysan to protect the New Lights from antinomian New Dispensationalism. And then, when this was accomplished, he turned against Paysan in order to create a tightly knit Baptist church. Harding was evidently converted sometime in 1785. He had a profoundly moving conversion experience, and he expected that everybody else should share the same emotional ecstasy and the ravishing of the soul which he had experienced. Soon after his conversion, he accompanied Paysant in March 1786 to Chester, where Harding served as the minister's special exhorter. Harding was obviously being tutored by Paysant, was also being tested in the field. Paysant was a, a little concerned about his protege, who had wandered off with some of, some of old acquaintance. He'd gone with a bad crew. Paysan pointed out in his journal that I saw what a danger he was in if he gave way to the enemy and Satan like a roving lion seeking whom he may devour, end of quote. But Harding was not devoured, at least not in the way Paysan had feared. He soon began to itinerate on his own to Liverpool in 1787, to Chester in 1788, throughout Annapolis County in 1789, to Onslow, Yarmouth, and Amherst in 1790, and back to Liverpool in 1791, to Shelburne, Barrington, Argyle, and Yarmouth. On his travels, Harding did everything in his power to emulate Henry Allen. He tried to look like Allen. According to one contemporary observer, his form was slender, frail, and even ghostly. In later life, however, Harding became quite corpulent. His length and breadth seemed to be so nearly equal as to suggest ideas of the square and cubicle, it was said. Harding, moreover, preached Allen's gospel, 
As far as Simeon Perkins was concerned, and he'd often heard Allen, Harding's doctrines are much the same as was propagated by Mr. Allen. Not only did Harding try to cultivate Allen's preaching style and physical image, he even gave the impression at times that he too was dying from con consumption. He also used many of Allen's techniques, and he carefully visited those areas where Allen had been successful. Harding, for example, used Allen's hymns, and he often explicitly appealed to women and children, and he even attempted to use Allen's imagery and language and wrote many letters to his friends in Horton and Cornwallis, hoping that these letters would eventually be published, thus making him famous. To Thaddeus Harris, he observed from Annapolis on May the 14th, 1789, the mighty god of Jeshurun has girded his sword upon his thigh, is riding in the flaming chariot of Israel like a glorious conqueror. His majesty and power are seen amongst the inhabitants of Annapolis. Some have of late felt his dying groans reach their despairing souls. I see again the immortal shore that flows with milk and honey. Harding was determined, as he graphic, graphically put it in 1791, to go in the name of Brother Allen's God. When asked once about the publication of his letters to the Christians, he could only answer, as he put it, with dear, dear Brother Allen, God forbid I should write or speak anything but what I would publish, if possible, over the four quarters of the globe. From the declining Loyalist Center of Shelburne, he wrote to Thaddeus Harris on August the 25th, 1791, O brother, stand in that gospel that Henry Allen once proclaimed to your soul and others in Cornwallis. That is the gospel, that is the life of my soul, and if I am called to it, it will not only suffer, but I will seal it with my blood. Two days later, Harding was planning to follow Allen to New England. Sometimes I can see a man stand and call, he asserted, come over and help me. I assuredly believe God has called me to preach the gospel on the other side of the flood in New England. But Harding never made his way to New England. Instead, he had to be satisfied with, as he put it, the general shaking of dry bones in Nova Scotia. <laughs> in addition, he could write to Allen's brother in Falmouth. There's a strange yet characteristic letter. The lowing of the milk high kind is heard in this land. The angel of the Lord is riding on the white horse through Barrington. Three are converted. Numbers under great distress, groaning for mercy, and almost every soul is sh shocked through the place. Jesus also spreads his blessed wings over Argyle. His kingdom has come into three souls in that place of late, and several are waiting heavily under their guilt. The saints frequently in meeting are crying aloud, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon and righteousness breaks in like an overflowing flood into our assembly. Harding could hardly contain his delight when he was told by one Nova Scotian in 1791 that his preaching was, in quotes, precisely the gospel that brought salvation to my soul under Henry Allen. In common with many of his close associates, Harding, in quotes, placed great reliance on impressions and often regarded them as direct intimations of the divine will, which it, it was his duty to obey, end of quote. Often he regarded his wish and desire to the explicit command of the Holy Spirit. It is not surprising, therefore, that Harding became a central figure in the new dispensation movement, which significantly affected the new life movement in the last decade of the 18th century. At the core of the movement were to be found Harris Harding, Joseph Dimmock, and James and Edward Manning. According to Edward Manning, after he had abandoned new dispensationalism, Mr. Allen's lax observance of divine inst instructions fostered in the minds of his followers such ideas as these, that the ordinances are only circumstantial, outward matters, and mere non-essentials, that the scriptures are not the only rule of faith and practice, and that no person is under any obligation to perform any external duty until God immediately impresses the mind so to do. Several began to question the propriety of having anything to do with external order or ordinances, and soon refused to commune with the church, as they had no rule to go by but their fancy, which they called the Spirit of God. Great irregularities ensued. 
In May 1791, the new dispensation movement took organizational form and ideological shape in Horton. It was an experience that the Reverend John Pazant would never forget, as Dr. Brian Cuthbertson had put it. He noted in his journal, the second Sabbath of May, it was the turn to have the church meeting and sacrament at Horton. Mrs. R. rose against all the orders of the church and said, they were but outward forms and contrary to the Spirit of God. These novelties in the church caused many to follow the same examples which made trouble in the church. She told me that she had seen the Spirit of God, that baptism and the Lord's Supper with, with all discipline of the church was contrary to the Spirit of God and His Gospel, and that marriage was from the devil, that she was determined to live separately from her husband, for it was as much sin for her to have children by him as by any other man, and she said that there were many who would follow her. By August, the church was badly split. All was in confusion. The supporters of what Pazin called these fantastical notions soon spread from town to town, and many adopted this new scheme. The main propagator of the new dispensationalism is Harris Harding, but he was ably assisted by the Mannings and Joseph Dimmock. Seeing that the new dispensationalists were threatening to destroy his church at Annapolis, the Reverend Thomas Hanley Chipman, unlike Paysand, proposed a quick counteroffensive. He wanted all the new dispensationalists expelled immediately from the churches. Chipman felt that unless this was done, the new light church would quickly disintegrate into warring, bitter factions. Paysand had little enthusiasm for spiritual battle. He was satisfied with waiting for events to determine the future flow of spiritual development in the province, and he escaped to Liverpool in 1793 to get away from the troublemakers in his church. Chipman, on the other hand, went on the offensive. He was determined, as Simeon Perkins cogently expressed it, to counteract the antinomian doctrines that had been propagated in this town, Liverpool, and the other parts of the province, principally by Mr. Harris Harding. In late 1793, it was clear that the new dispensation movement had peaked and was on the decline, especially in the Horton Cornwallis region. The Mannings and Joseph Dimmock had been frightened and appalled by the antinomian excesses practiced by many of their former associates. Moreover, the disorder and chaos which seemed endemic to the movement appeared to threaten the already fragile underpinnings of Nova Scotia society. Short-term ecstasy was one thing. Permanent confusion and disorientation was quite a different thing. The Baptist church polity advocated by Chipman became increasingly attractive. Joseph Dimmock, who had been baptized in 1787, was ordained a minister of the Chester New Light Church on September the 10th, 1793. It was an ordination endorsed by Chipman and Paysant. Then in the following year, in a controversial ceremony, Harding was ordained as minister of the Onslow Church by his close friend Dimmock. Neither Chipman nor Paysant felt able to participate in the ceremony since they felt, as Paysant put it, that Harding had spoke much against ordination, against ordained ministers, against the orders of the church, and many such things. Harding, in other words, was an unreconstructed new dispensationalist unworthy of the Christian ministry. Edward Manning, who was converted under Paysant's ministry in May 1789, was ordained on October the 19th, 1795, as minister of the Cornwallis New Light Church. After spending some time in Maine with Baptist preachers and under great pressure from his brother James and Thomas Hanley Chipman, Edward was baptized in 1797 by Chipman. A year earlier, James Manning had been baptized by Chipman as well. He was ordained two years later. The other father of the Nova Scotia Baptist Church, Theodore Seth Harding, was baptized on May the 31st, 1795, and ordained at the age of 23 in the following year. According to Theodore Harding, the Horton Revival of 1799 spread all down till it reached Yarmouth, and then Harris Harding joined the Baptists. Harris Harding had first visited Yarmouth in 1790, largely in response to a vivid dream. I dreamed, he observed, I was on board a small sailboat with Deacon Cleveland and a number of my Christian friends at Horton. He thought I stood upon the gunwale of the boat, having a spear in my hand. The sun shone with peculiar brightness. We were running before a pleasant breeze at a little distance from a delightful shore. The water also was as clear as crystal. I could see the white and shining fishes at the bottom, 
while I was continually catching them with the spear. My friends, I thought, were sitting, speaking of Christ's love to a fallen world, their cheeks bathed with tears and apparently filled with peace and joy. I thought the deacon said to me, you catch every fish you strike. I replied, I miss none. You thought I fished until I had got the boat filled and then had a delicious feast with my fellow disciples. I woke in a joyful frame. I visited Yarmouth soon after. <laughs> the Reverend Jonathan Scott, Allen's formidable foe, was still at Chabot. He would not leave the province for New England until 1793. While in the Yarmouth region in 1792, Harding helped articulate into existence a revival of religion. There was, he reported on January 27, 1792, a little cloud like the bleeding hand of Jesus in this part of the vineyard. By April, as he put it, near 50 are savingly born again. When the revival fires were dampened in Yarmouth, Harding moved off to Liverpool. There were obviously souls to catch all along the Atlantic shore. The following year, Harding was in the Cobequid region, leading a revival there. Then in 1794, as has been mentioned earlier, he was ordained at Onslow. The following year, he was on the move again. In 1796, he was in Liverpool. Finally, on May the 19th, 1797, his Trot Onslow Church, in quotes, ordered a letter to be sent to call Reverend Harris Harding home. But Harding refused to leave Yarmouth. He had, in all likelihood, moved there from Liverpool late in 1796. In the early months of 1796, Harding had played a key role in bringing about what Perkins called a remarkable stir of religious concern among people. There was an extraordinary stir among young people, principally the females, according to Perkins. There were, according to him, such much swooning and ecstasy. Harding was exited by the experience. He spent a great deal of time with young people in the community, and some of the young women developed, as one of them put it, a great natural fondness for him, and thought all his tender expressions for their souls was the effect of natural passion, end of quote. Many young women had felt the same way about Henry Allen. They were obviously sexually and spiritually attracted to men of vigor, decisiveness, and they land. His relationship with one young woman, however, Harding went beyond the accepted norms of behavior. Perhaps he was, as Paisan suggested, merely putting into practice his antinomian beliefs, or it may have been that he was trapped into marriage by a scheming Hetty Harrington. All that is certain is that under strong community pressure, Harding publicly confessed that he had impregnated the girl. On September 28th, he married her. Six weeks later, a child was born to the couple. Harding's supporters, who had wished him to replace Paisan, now withdrew their support. And early in 1797, Harding was called to the Armouth Church. He continued to preach at Liverpool in 1797, but only in private houses. He obviously still had his supporters, who are willing to forgive a man who was a sinner like themselves, but also one who seemed to be a human conduit for the Holy Spirit. In Yarmouth, Harding kept school for the support of his family. Influenced by growing Baptist support in other regions of the province, and under considerable pressure from old friends like the Mannings and Dimmock, Harding was finally baptized by James Manning on August the 28th, 1799. A revival was then sweeping through Yarmouth, and Manning had been sent for to assist in the work. Manning described Harding's baptism in the following graphic manner. At the time the ordinance of baptism was administered, the people looked as solemn as the grave. Mr. Harding's coming to the water seemed like Christ coming to Jordan. After he came from the water, he prayed with the people in the street. It seemed as though he had a double portion of the Spirit. Some of the dear Christians broke forth in praises to God and the Lamb. The revival of 1799 and 1800 centered at Horton and radiated in all directions, up into the St. John River Valley, into Cumberland, down the Annapolis Valley of Yarmouth, into Argyle and Barrington. It was obviously a Baptist revival. There was therefore a great deal of truth in Bishop Charles Inglis's report to the SBG, in which he warned, in quotes, of the prevalence of an enthusiastic and dangerous spirit among a sect in the province called New Light, whose religion seems to be a strange jumble of New England independence and Bohemianism. Formerly, they were pedo baptists but by recent illumination, they have adopted the Anabaptist scheme, by which their number has been much increased and their zeal inflamed. 
Inglis was particularly concerned with Harris Harding's impact. According to the bishop, intelligence from the arm of the area stressed that a rage for dipping or total immersion prevails all over the western counties of the province and is frequently performed in a very indelicate manner before vast collections of people. Several hundreds have already been baptized, and this plunging they deem to be absolutely necessary to the conversion of their souls. On the Sunday preceding these sol solemnities, the preacher sits above the congregation with a number of select brethren on lower benches appointed to assist them. Inglis also charged the Baptist leaders were engaged in a general plan of total revolution in religion and civil government. There was no substantiation for this charge, but for Inglis' contention, the Baptist preachers were profoundly influenced by the work of Thomas Paine. The Anglican bishop, despite some of the glaring inaccuracies in his report, nevertheless has correctly perceived the important transformation of many new lights into Baptists. Concerned about the need for order and discipline, Paysan, the Mannings, and Thomas Hanley Chipman met in, met in July of 1797, agree in, walk, in quotes, to walk together in fellowship and ministers of Jesus Christ and to hold a yearly conference to know our minds and the state of the different churches standing connection by their delegates being sent by them, end of quote. In June of 1798, the conference took place at Cornwallis. According to Edward Manning's minutes, Mr. Hanley Chipman spoke concerning the nature of the association, met again at five o'clock, discoursed largely upon the necessity of order and discipline in the churches, and continued until midnight in observing the dangerous tendency or erroneous principles and practices and lamenting the unhappy consequence in our churches, end of quote. Harris Harding re requested admission to the conference. It was pointed out that he, in quotes, had deeply fallen into errors by continuing to espouse the cause of new dispensationalism. Harding, in quotes, professed sorrow, humbly acknowledged his offenses, signed a document to that effect, craved forgiveness of his brethren, and was received, end of quote. Sometime in 1799, the Reverend Thomas Hanley Chipman visited Boston, confer with the Reverend Samuel Stillman, the minister of the First Baptist Church in Boston, about the suit being brought against the Reverend Enoch Towner for conducting an illegal marriage. Chipman was also in Boston collecting ammunition, for his final assault and decaying outworks of the New Light Church. At the annual conference held in 1800, Chipman presented a closed Baptist communion plan. The Reverend John Paysant was furious. When he confronted Chipman, the Annapolis preacher replied that Mr. Towner had been sued for marrying, and in order to defend the suit, he had adopted that plan, that they might be called by, sa by same names, for they were looked upon as nobody. As Baptists, they would have some status in the community. They could stress their link with the Danbury Association in New England. Without this link and without the, the name, they were without power and influence. It was proposed the association name be changed from Congregational and Baptist to the Nova Scotia Baptist Association. The Mannings, Dimmick, Chipman, the Hardings and Towner, Joseph Crandall, but not Paysand, accepted their certificates as members of the Baptist Association. It was then agreed by the Baptist ministers present that as many as persons are cast upon the churches of Christ and the ministers of the gospel for erroneous principles, etc., the associated ministers and messengers judge it expedient that our church articles of faith and practice should be printed and the churches in connection should defray the expense of printing said articles and the plan of the association. Alan Seck, in a sense, had in 1800 become the Nova Scotia Baptist Church. Chipman's Baptist yoke never rested easily in Harding's shoulders. He resented the growing pressure to exclude those who had not been baptized as adults from communion. He was willing, however, to accept the 1802 association resolution, in quote, that the ordinance of baptism should not be administered to any but those that join the church except in cases where they cannot be blessed with such a privilege, end of quote. Harding, it is clear, was not all that interested in association politics. He was more concerned in 1805 and 1806 with the fact that, as he put it, the religious aspect in Yarmouth was sadly dark. He must have also been worried about the arrival in 1806 of the Reverend Rana Cossett, an Anglican minister from Sydney. Cossett was well known as a person who appealed to the lower class of people. Harding needed some convincing proof 
that he was indeed doing God's work in Yarmouth. He was thinking about abandoning the ministry unless, as he put it, his commission were sealed afresh with tokens of success. He therefore decided to will into existence the Great Reformation. Under a strong presentment of approaching blessing, blessing, he ventured to employ language like this. Sinners, I have long entreated you to repent and believe, but now I tell you, God by his Spirit is coming to convince you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come, and convert your soul. Fight against him much longer you cannot, or the Lord never spoke to me nor by me. I am a deceiver and deceived. Harding, like Alan, was able to use the spoken word like a bare and brutal engine against the head and heart of his hearers. His sermons, it was noted, abounded with short, pithy sayings, such as are apt to stick to the memory like burrs. There is apparently only one extant verbatim excerpt from one of his early sermons. But this excerpt must have been characteristic of most of his sermons. We don't always criticize as heaven will by and by. The holiness of God is a sinner's torment. A natural man could no more see beauty in Christ than a blind man can in colors. If Christ is anywhere, he is in the converted soul. Heaven is a change of nature. True faith is not in the head, but in the heart. To meet with Christ is more than all the meetings in the world. Christ is the ordinance makes it sweet. Christians do more oft times to scatter souls from Christ than the unconverted do. Where there's no love, there's no grace. I am going down to the grave. Blessed be God. There is a crown of faith laid up for them that love him. Belief is the worst sin that a man can unbelief is the worst sin that a man can commit. If God loves you, he loves you unchangeably. He does not love you for your frames and feelings. He loves you for his namesake. If you don't love holiness, you don't love God. At the start of a typical sermon, Harding's manner, as was once recalled, was still and moderate. But gradually he became more and more agitated. His mind and words began to run off in all kinds of directions. And then his voice became louder and louder, and his speech rapid and indistinct until at length little was heard but sound, loud, confused, and intensely earnest. Next, there were copious tears and uncontrolled, unrestrained action and movement. For Harding, the Holy Spirit was at work. And for many of those who heard him, there was a powerful sense of empathy and understanding with the preacher and the message with which they obviously resonated. Harding was able to create an intense human involvement with the present, with here and now existence, as well as with the indefinite eternal future. His word and his tears obviously had a great impact on his listeners. It, it was as though his sometimes disjointed words, permeated with intense feeling, captured the essence of the Christian gospel. For many, it was a shattering psychological experience. It was as if the entire New Testament was suddenly uttered in one prolonged Harding sentence. Being powered projections, Harding's words took upon themselves an aura of power. It was ironic and perhaps only fitting, the man who, according to his biographer, gloried to the last that he was a new light, first and foremost, and who also found it so difficult to abandon his new, dis dis his new dispensationalism, should witness the undermining of the Reformation by friends putting forward arguments he had used a decade or so earlier. There is a particularly evocative description of these enthusiasts in J. Davis's life and time, the late Reverend Har Harris Harding. They had no regard for order or government in the church. Frills, ruffles, all adornment and dress were their abomination, and they quarreled with Mr. Harding because he would not preach against such things. They brought these peculiarities into conference meetings, and warm discussions were held upon them there. They attacked their minister in public and openly contradicted him. They ascended the pulpit. Even the sisters, in the heat of their inspiration, stood at his side and commanded him to hold his peace. The worship of God was thus changed into confusion and hubbub. Then these people would collect their finery and commit it to the flames. Some would even take their crockery and china ware from their shelves and bury them. They would enter into a minute confession of their sins before promiscuous assemblages. They would form processions in the night and parade the streets, exclaiming, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Not only did Harding experience a sickening dose of his own spiritual medicine, he also, in 1809, reluctantly withdrew his church from the Baptist Association. 
The precipitating issue was closed communion. In 1808, former friends, the new dispensationalists, argued that in order to ensure continued Baptist growth, it was essential to abandon once and for all open communion. It was contended that, in quotes, if believers' baptism is the only baptism in the New Testament, those who have been sprinkled in infancy or afterwards were not lawfully admissible to the Lord's Supper, end of quote. At the 1809 association meeting held in Cornwallis, the problem was finally resolved. Harris Harding supported open communion, maintaining the prime concern of the Baptist ministers was, as he put it, to rely entirely upon that divine influence with which the apostles were favored when they were setting men apart for the work of the ministry or building up the church of God. And he treated them not to be particular respecting external order or outward form, which would all perish in the using. Harding was attacked by Theodore Har uh, Harding, who, in quote, observed that when the tabernacle was to be erected in the wilderness, divine direction was given respecting every part, even for the loops. He considered that the great head of the church would be in like manner followed with underrating strictness. This argument was enthusiastically endorsed by the Reverend Henry Hale, visiting Baptist preacher from Massachusetts. Eventually, three churches, Yarmouth, Argyle, and Chester, withdrew from the Baptist Association, and each of these churches had close ties with Harris Hardy. In 1808, there were 1,248 members in the 11 Nova Scotia churches belonging to the association. In 1809, after withdrawal, there were only 753 in the eight closed communion Baptist churches. Harris Harding's church had been the second largest in the association, 250 strong, in comparison with Horton's 276. It was not until 1828 that Harding's church was reunited to the association. In 1811, Chester had rejoined. In 1837, Argyle, in somewhat different form, returned to the Baptist fold. When Harris Harding died in 1854, his church had over 700 members. And a decade later, it was calculated that there were more than 2,000 Baptists in the Yarmouth region, in quotes, under the care of eight pastors, end of quote. Harding had found it difficult to die the good Christian death. He could not observe his biographer taste those raptures in which he had been wont to luxuriate, regarding them as special proofs of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. All the old Christian warrior could say at his deathbed was, good words, good words, but the Lord was not here. The Lord was not here. It would be a mistake to exaggerate Harding's importance in the fascinating symbiotic relationship connecting Nova Scotia's Second Great Awakening with the transformation of the New Life Movement in the Baptist Church. Nor should Harding's role be underestimated. He certainly was not a charismatic religious leader in the, in the Allen tradition, nor was he an organizational genius in the Timothy Dwight mold. But, it may be argued, he was an important link between the First and the Second Great Awakening. In a very real sense, he succeeded in applying the Allen paradigm of revitalization to another chronological period and to a different mix of people. Harding, in many respects, was a sensitive reflector of the religious aspiration of the thousands of Nova Scotians to whom he diligently preached his highly emotional and introspective version of the Christian gospel. American influences, direct and indirect, events in Europe, economic and social stress in Nova Scotia may have provided the general framework in which the Second Great Awakening worked itself out. Yet, without men like Harding, no great reformation would have been possible. And without him, moreover, the great reformation would have been quite a different kind of religious movement.